Welcome to Rust Belt Abolition Radio. My name is Andres. Today we turn to recent news of the deepening impacts of the biggest prison strike in U.S. history as we look at Kinross Correctional Facility in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. We also speak with Professor Liat Ben Moshe on our carceral state and the political imaginary of abolition. We end today's show with a phone interview with Chaz, an imprisoned trans organizer in Michigan who is fighting for queer and trans prisoners' liberation. I'm Kay Syed here with A. Maria, and you're listening to Rust Belt Abolition Radio, an abolitionist media and movement building project based in Detroit, Michigan. In this show, we amplify the voices of those impacted by mass incarceration and explore ongoing work in our movement to abolish the carceral state that is, prisons, police, courts, as well as racial domination and capitalist exploitation. Rust Belt Abolition Radio seeks to strengthen community collaboration and challenge the idea that putting people in cages and shackling them with electronic devices solves the problems produced by racial capitalism. Let's expand our ability to struggle against the ways in which the carceral state impacts our daily lives and to create a space where we can both imagine and remake our world anew. What does a world without prisons, police, and property look like? What kind of social relations are engendered when we solve our problems not by dialing the magic number, 911, but by resolving problems ourselves? These are the kinds of questions that abolitionists ask. Prison abolition is not simply about finally letting go of an old form of solving problems, putting people in cages. Abolition also entails reshaping the ways in which we relate to one another in all scales. One of the ways Detroiters are working to relate together is through building community radio. Community radio has the power to amplify social movements and counter the social death sentences imposed on our communities. It affirms that none of us are disposable and that the production of ideas in our homes and streets matters. This radio project relies on a careful ear, an eagerness to learn and be challenged, and the ability to weave together a bigger picture for the benefit of listeners and those whose stories and struggles are being voiced. By providing a platform to share in-depth analysis informed by neighborhood expertise, Rust Belt Abolition Radio underpins self-determination and directly counters the narratives that stifle the needs and dreams of our communities. Now we turn to Alejo Stark, a co-producer of this show and the media spokesperson for Michigan Abolition and Prisoner Solidarity, MAPS. It's a statewide group organizing in solidarity with prisoners against the violence of incarceration and has propelled mainstream media coverage of the events of last fall's nationwide prison strike. The September 9, 2016 prisoner uprising in the United States was the largest and most widespread rebellion organized by prisoners in U.S. history. The call to action was made by imprisoned organizers from the Free Alabama Movement in light of the anniversary of the Attica prison riots of September 9, 1971. On the outside, it was supported by organizers with the Incarcerated Workers Organizing Committee of the IWW. However, the widespread character of the uprising demonstrates the widespread state of the crisis of mass incarceration. In the state of Michigan, as far as we know, only rebels in prison at the Kinross Correctional Facility joined in the nationwide September 9 uprising. Among many demands, the prisoners demanded higher wages. Laundry workers at Kinross, for instance, make only $20 a month. I spoke with Evelyn Summers, whose husband is incarcerated at Kinross, about the events of September 9. My name is Evelyn Williams, and I am now the wife of Anthony Bates, and he's a prisoner at the Kinross Correctional Facility. Can you tell us about a call that you made to your husband on September 9th of 2016? You know, I was playing, that was my weekend, I was playing to go up. And he had told me, you know, kind of the eighth, he had kind of told me what was going on, and I might not be able to come. On the ninth, he called me. He was like, well, they let all the regular visits and things come through, and so we should be okay. But he did tell me they had, wouldn't feed them their normal food. It was going to give them like a cheese sandwich and a banana for each one of the meals, or a cheese sandwich and three cookies and some milk for some of the meals, and they wasn't giving them their regular meals. And so a lot of them would get upset about that because they should have been, you know, they got a, a the food service should have been feeding them what the scheduled meal was. On Saturday the 10th, I was actually getting ready to go. I was actually waiting for the people to rent the car people to come get me, you know, so I can go up there. He called me in a panic that morning, like 8, 8.15. He was like, don't come. The sirens is going off. They're about to lock us down. He couldn't talk a little because the sirens was going off and it was making, you know, everybody go to their room and, you know, locking everything down. I didn't know what was going on. So it took a week almost before I ever talked to him again. 
You couldn't get through the phone. You couldn't get through even to talk to an officer there. The lines just said, we're upon an immobilization. Try your call again. And that happened almost for a week. I'm just looking at Facebook and I'm seeing different posts from the free press and people talking about what was going on and what happened. I don't know if they were able to hear from somebody who maybe had a contraband phone or something like that, but there's people putting reports that were scaring the death out of me because I didn't know what was going on. So you didn't hear about your, your husband for, for a full week? You called, you heard the sirens, and you had no idea what was going on? Not at all. All I'm hearing is the media reports and what I'm seeing on Facebook. All you hear is the damage or you know where your loved one is. You know, you hear about all the, the EFT agents and things going in. The emergency response team, yeah. But you don't know if they're okay. You don't know what's going on. What did you find out afterwards about what had happened? You know, you told us you heard about the sirens this Saturday morning and the emergency response team from Paul Egan's article. What did you find out about what happened afterwards? When he was finally able to call me, which was that following Thursday or Friday, I mean, called at like 10, 10, 15 in the morning, as soon as they let the, you know, the lockdown off. And he just told me everything that had happened about the zip tying. The gentleman about the guys, they tried to peaceably talk to the ward. The wards had come out and kind of promised them that they would supply some of their demands, take care of everything that they were asking, and the things that he couldn't, they would go to legislation about. You know, he said everybody walked away peaceful and fine. He said the warden stepped out the yard, shut the door. The guys went about their regular day thinking everything was okay, that they had just came to a common solution. He said, before you know it, here all these police and tactical guys coming in, zip-tying them, pulling guys out the shower, fire and pepper spray. The guys in the very back unit, I guess the one that had the most damage, they tried to barricade themselves in, and the guys broke through there. You know, the, the police officers and things broke through there. He said, all the regular unit police, they just all disappeared off the unit. Just out of nowhere, they just all started leaving their post. He said, he knew something was kind of wrong. And then all these armed guards with shotguns came in there. So some of the guys had to sit out in the rain, some of them half naked or even had to use the bathroom on themselves, zip tied outside for five and six hours. So even though prisoners of Kinross met with the warden and seemed to have gotten to an agreement, you're saying they were still, as they went back peacefully, they were repressed by the emergency response team and zip tied, as you're saying, and left, left out in the cold. What do you think about all this? What do you think about this repression? And well, I think it is wrong, of course. Um, I think the guys, who no, that, that no time, that even when they were marching around the yard that morning, he said it was a peaceful demonstration. And even if you look at the reports, his real reports, everything said the guys were just walking around. They wasn't causing no disturbance. They just wanted to see the warden. The warden came. You know, all they wanted to do was get a couple of things that were against policy changed. It was nothing, and it was it's a force to dehumanize these men. Because even one gentleman I keep in contact with as well that was moved out, he did nothing. He had no part of this. And they moved him to a level five, you know, maximum security prison for no reason. And now when they try to fight the ticket or fight a grievance, they always lose. You know, it's another way to repress and dehumanize these men. And you've had a chance to talk with your with your husband about this afterwards, right? What, what does he think about the situation and process of dehumanization of, of prisoners, as you call it? He's living it every day. You know, he always talks about it being the modern-day slavery. A lot of them don't have family. You know, they can't even afford soap and basic things. And then a lot of them come from the inner city. And so it's a even harder burden on their families to have to go through them and support them and things like that. And it makes... Somebody who already is serving sentences, it, it does not prepare them to come back for the world. I think that's what his biggest problem is. They don't do anything to prepare them to come back. And so they're always left at a disadvantage. Even ones who come home and get out are left at a disadvantage. So now the society looks at them as a criminal. They can't get a job. They're in there with no education, no programs, no anything, and no pay. And it ends up being a revolving door because now to kind of make money or make things happen, they come back out here and they get into the same lifestyle because a system that's meant to rehabilitate them has failed them. Well, thank you so much for your words, Evelyn. In more recent news, we have heard that retaliation against organizers and others involved in the Kinros uprising is much worse than is publicly well known. There are almost 200 prisoners that are staying in the hole, that is, in solitary confinement, for up to a year. We stand in solidarity with all those struggling against the brutality of imprisonment and want to emphasize that the rebellions did not start on September 9. 
In fact, in March and April of 2016, rebels in three Michigan facilities demonstrated the great maxim of the Haitian Revolution, unity makes strength, by staging hunger strikes in those facilities. Nothing changed between March and September, and nothing has changed since September, except the prisoners are now better organized to struggle against the walls and cages that imprison them. As such, we think that the rebellions will and should continue. Now we speak with Professor Liat Ben Moshe about our carceral society and the political imaginary of abolition. But first, a brief clip from Dr. Ruth Wilson Gilmore on what she means by abolition. Dr. Ruth Wilson Gilmore is director of the Center for Place, Culture, and Politics and professor of Earth and Environmental Sciences at the Graduate Center CUNY. She is a co-founder of many social justice organizations, including California Prison Moratorium Project, Critical Resistance, and the Central California Environmental Justice Network. In her book, Golden Gulag, Prisons, Surplus, Crisis, and Opposition in Globalizing California, she examined how political and economic forces produce California's prison boom. We open this segment with a recording of Dr. Gilmore's presentation on prison abolition, courtesy of the Connecticut Coalition to Oppose Indefinite Detention. All right, I am an abolitionist. Abolition. Abolition is a plot against racial capitalism, which is all capitalism, not just some of it. It is a plot in a narrative sense. It is a plot in which the arc of change is always going resolutely toward freedom. It is a plot in a geographic sense. It is a plot in which we aim to make all space, not just some space, free in two senses. Free in the sense that it cannot be alienated, which is to say sold by anybody to anybody. And free in the sense of non-exclusive. There is no boundary or border that would keep somebody in or keep somebody out. That is abolition. That's the plot. That's my plot. It is an internationalist impulse that is part of what many of us call the black radical tradition, which is open for all. If the aim of abolition is to make all space free and non-exclusive, with no boundary or border that would keep somebody in or keep somebody out, how do we reconcile that with the impulse to move people out of prisons and into mental health facilities? Dr. Liat Ben Moshe is Assistant Professor of Disability Studies at the University of Toledo and a scholar activist who works in the intersection of prison abolition, anti-psychiatry, deinstitutionalization, and disability justice. She is co-editor of Disability Incarcerated, Imprisonment and Disability in the United States and Canada. I spoke with Dr. Ben Moshe about the abolitionary mindset and asked, what does this mindset lead us to question? What an abolitionary mindset on prison really does is that it leads us to question really deep, profound question around you know, what do we call innocence? What is harm? What do we do when people harm us? What is safety? Why do we feel safe? Who's the we, right? Why do we feel safe under certain condition and not others? And again, I'm really saying who's the we, I think is one of the profound questions here too. Who's not the we? And what are the consequences of that uh, erasure and exclusion it's about vulnerability, it's about care, it's about like so many different questions. So it's really not, what people think, I think about prison abolition is that it's about closing prisons. It really crystallizes for us the society in which we live in, the values that it has, and the kind of alternative structures that we want to put in place. Do you think we can wait for abolition? And how do you respond to the critiques that people lay on an abolitionary mindset? I started to think recently more broadly about the abolitionary mindset through really the lens of not just prison abolition, but, you know, we can talk about the abolition of slavery as well. But from my work also on deinstitutionalization, and that taught me a lot of different lessons around the critiques that people lay on an abolitionary mindset. So if we take prison abolition as an example, and this is 
word for word what was said about the instrumentalization and a lot of it, a little bit less word for word around an abolition of slavery, is that uh, people said it's not realistic in the current society that we live in. Like this might work really well in like Norway or something, but they didn't say that about slavery, but about prisons and institutions that it's not, the conditions are not ripe right now. So maybe, you know, we need to wait a little bit. And people did say that about slavery as well. It's a good idea, right? It's kind of an ethical idea that um, we can think about, but not right now. Like it's not, there's not like alternatives in place. People are not ready. People often say about abolition is that it's only a critique, that it's not prescriptive, doesn't offer us anything, that it doesn't give us like specific solutions as to what to do. It only critiques what we have right now. And so what I want to say is that this is the beauty of abolition, is all those things. These are not really critiques because the beauty of abolition to me is that it is an ethical position. And it's an ethical position in which the time is always ripe for. We cannot wait. I mean, sla slaves couldn't wait, right, till the time is right, uh, right. People who are rotting in institutions and prisons... And when I say institution, by the way, I mean mostly um, these kind of large-scale residential institutions for people with intellectual disabilities. People couldn't wait for the right time to do that. And unfortunately, people did die in these places while waiting for us to do something. Uh, and it took a really long time to get rid of kind of that mindset that people with disabilities need to be in these facilities. And even though right now in the U.S., I mean, there are um, still a lot of states that have these um, large-scale institutions for people with intellectual disabilities and psychiatric hospitals, most states in the U.S. do not. And there's about 13 states in the U.S. right now that don't have any residential institutions that are large-scale, you know, so over 16 people for people with intellectual disabilities. So what happened? We don't have people with disabilities? I mean, no, that's not what happened. We just decided that as a society, as a policy, as a culture, we rid ourselves of this as an option. Like, this is not an option. And so if it's not an option, what do we do? And that, lo and behold, opened so many opportunities because the idea that it wasn't prescriptive, I mean, it, it's true. People didn't know what to do. I mean, there were some experts who said, you know, this might work, this might work. But ultimately, things can only work when you try them out. And you can try them out if all the money and all the efforts go into reforming institutions, building more institutions, making them better, putting more people in them, and so on. Once we got rid of that, we found out a lot of other ways of relating to people. Now, not all of it is successful. Uh, not all of it will be successful. And it's not successful also for different people, right? But uh, on the ground, we could never find these things if we're so committed to other projects of incarceration. And so it really is an either-or kind of situation. So not being prescriptive is actually really useful for an abolitionary praxis. Not being realistic, I think, is also something that's said a lot about abolition. Like, you're not, you're not, it's not realistic. Like, it's great. I'm with you all the way, right? It's, as an ethical stance, abolition is wonderful. But, you know, it's not realistic. Of course, that's also not true because prison is not realistic, it's absolutely not a realistic project. And I think people from the right and the left are starting to critique it for very, very different reasons, but especially because of that, that it's absolutely not a sustainable project. And so I think our ideas of what is realistic or not are really tainted by the kind of goals that we have. And I think for abolitionists, when, you know, when we see liberation you know, as the goal and we see a completely different structure of society as the goal, that we're not confined by these kind of critiques. We actually see them as opportunities to make something. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the logics of incarceration. Where does incarceration take place and why is that important? Incarceration happens not just in spaces behind bars. So, for instance, uh, and we know this, for, for a lot of people with disabilities, especially intellectual and psychiatric disabilities, so the kind of more let's say, invisible, perhaps, forms of disabilities, their uh, forms of incarceration is usually in things like nursing homes or uh, institutions or psych wards, places that we don't often think about as carceral spaces, but they're incarcerated there nonetheless. And so if we only think about prisons, we don't think about those spaces. And the reason why it's important, uh, especially for activism, is because then when we talk about 
oh, we really need to abolish or even reform prison spaces, we often think about things like, oh, what we can do is open psych wards or make sure that people are not in prison, but maybe they're in nursing homes. And what people with disabilities are telling us is that they see themselves as incarcerated in those spaces. So those are not in any way progressive moves on our part to get rid of one space and then open another space. It's just as carceral or in, or in case in carceral logics. You take seriously the notion of the carceral archipelago presented by French social theorist Michel Foucault. This concept encourages us to consider the control of public space and the disciplining of society through means such as surveillance and checkpoints, and illuminates why it's important to think about the carceral rather than just the prison when advancing abolition. I think the other thing that's really important is that it moves us from thinking about things with walls to more thinking about the logics of incarceration. So what does it mean to live in uh, a carceral state? And that's not just those people that are over there behind bars. And I think thinking about the carceral archipelago and carceral logics really frees us from those binaries so that it's not just those people that we're trying to free you know, kind of like a savior complex, but it's really about what is my role within a carceral state? How am I embedded within the prison industrial complex, for example, but other carceral sites? Now, we turn to the struggle of those who are queer and trans and incarcerated at the G. Robert Cotton Correctional Facility in Jackson, Michigan, where they are routinely sexually harassed and demeaned by correctional officers. Sexual harassment of prisoners is a violation of the Federal Prison Rape Elimination Act. When some of the prisoners filed grievances against officers for the illegal behavior, they experienced further mistreatment and retaliation, with officers ganging up against them in coordinated efforts to retaliate against the grievances. We may be caged, but we're not animals, said trans inmate Chaz. Chaz was an activist inside the Jackson facility until being recently transferred to Carson City, Michigan. A former nurse, she hopes to be a public speaker when she's released. We talked with her about what it's like to be a trans activist on the inside. This call is from a correction facility and is subject to monitoring and recording. Thank you for using GTL. We are caged, but we are not animals. And being an activist in prison, it, it enriches me. You know, it empowers me. It makes me feel like. I'm not alone and I have a voice, especially when you meet other activists on the inside and outside that will fight for you and not just that, but fight with you. That's mostly important because for so many years, I felt like I was just alone. Like I didn't have that voice where nobody listening, where nobody willing to fight. You know, like everybody here, I'm tough, I'm a game banger, I'm this, but ain't nobody willing to go to the hole and fight. And I just refuse to lay down. You know, so being an activist for me has made me more self-confident. It has healed a lot of my past wounds and hurts. So it made me focus on what's important. So being an activist for me, Jimmy, on the inside has been really amazing because it makes me feel like I'm still a human being and that I have a purpose. In the spirit of liberation and abolition, this week we commemorate the anniversary of the Haitian Revolution, the most successful slave uprising in history. The slaves of Saint Dumont, now Haiti, rose up against their French masters, expelling them from the island and striking a blow against slavery, colonialism, imperialism, and racial capitalism. As Afro-Trinidadian Marxist intellectual and socialist militant C.L.R. James wrote in his History of the Haitian Revolution, titled The Black Jacobins, quote, In 1789, the French bourgeoisie was the most powerful economic force in France, and the slave trade and the colonies were the basis of its wealth and power, end quote. C.L.R. James thereby ties capitalist accumulation and slavery as interlocking and overlapping modes of production and demonstrating that capitalism was always already racial. In other words, 
the economic success of the French bourgeoisie was founded on the exploitation of the black workers in St. Dumont. As such, the struggle for the abolition of slavery, for human liberation, is also the struggle for the abolition of capitalism. It is in this way that we invoke the long history and the spirit of abolition and call forth the words of C.L.R. James in The Black Jacobins. The rich are only defeated when running for their lives. Today, the struggle toward an abolitionist future for a world without capitalist exploitation and racial domination, a world without prisons, private property, and police, continues. Thanks for tuning in. Check out our website at www.rustbeltradio.org. This show was co-produced by the Rust Belt Abolition Radio Team. Andres, A. Maria, Cape Syed, and Alejo Stark. Thank <laughs> you.